We've covered all of the transistor configurations, the common base, the common collector, and the common emitter. And now it's time to start putting multiple stages of these transistors together and improving them to get more gain out of them, either voltage or current. Like all of the other configurations, we start out by setting or determining what the DC parameters are going to be because that's what the AC is going to be working off of once we get a Q point. And in this circuit, you're going to notice that we have two transistor stages. Uh, we have stage T1 and T2, so that's transistor 1, transistor 2. And you'll see that we have the 56K ohm and the 6.8K ohm, and the same values over here. And also the same values on RC, and we have the splitter emitter resistors, RE1, RE2, and RE3, RE4. That means that the DC is going to be the the same for both of these circuits. So whatever we uh, compute on here for one of these circuits applies to the other one and this makes it a little bit simpler because we don't have to do the math two times. And, you know it's not that hard. Uh, the math isn't that hard but anything you can do to make your life easier, give it a shot. Both of these are common emitters and remember you can always identify what kind of a configuration you have by, by looking at the circuit and finding which of the outputs or which, which of the leads on the transistor does not have a input or an output. And you can see we're going to apply 60 millivolts peak, so this is an input. And our output is being taken off of the collector. And since the emitter has no connection in or out, we call this one a common emitter. And the second stage takes the input from the first stage. It's capacitively coupled. And so therefore, the, the, the base has a connection, and the output is on the collector, so we have another common emitter circuit. And if you remember, we should get some you know, certain characteristics that are unique to the common emitter in that you know, each stage is going to flip the signal 180 degrees. So we're going to start out in, in one phase. Let's say we're going positive on this stage. That means we're going to be going negative on the output of this stage negative on the input of this stage, and then this one's going to flip it another 180 degrees, so we're going to be back in phase on our output, RL. And there might be a slight phase shift between input and output because we're going through all of these capacitors and the reactances could affect the, the phase. But I've selected suitably large capacitors, excessively large capacitors, so they're not really going to have any effect at all. As a matter of fact, I think the XC that I calculated for these was less than half an ohm for each one of these uh, caps and it's, it's going to be negligible at best. Not ideal, you can't really get that, but negligible at best. So starting out by getting the, vo start out by getting the voltage on the base, so we're going, to R we're going to use our voltage divider formula and we're interested in what the value is on RB2 and RB4, but if we get the value on one, we have the value for the other since everything is identical vol voltage divider wise. So we're looking at the uh, 6 point, if I can get my pen to write, Six point eight k ohm resistor for RB2 over 56k plus 6.8k times 12 volts and we're going to get 1.3 volts on the base. So we have 1.3 volts here and 1.3 volts here. And of course we know that the emitter voltage is going to be 7 tenths of a volt less than the voltage on the base. So we're going to get, you know, just simple subtraction and we should get about 0.6 volts or 600 millivolts. So we should have 0.6 volts on the emitter. And with that we can now get the current that's going through this circuit. 
and the 0.6 divided by RE and we're going to get two and a half milliamps of current going through RE. Since I'm using 2N 3904s again, and I'm starting to write what I say, so <laughs> but they should be two point five milliamps. Since I'm using two N thirty nine oh four, the beta as a minimum should be one hundred, which means the alpha is going to be ninety nine or better. So whatever current we have on the emitters is going to be the same as the current that we have on the collectors. And we now want to find what the voltage drop is on RC1 and RC2. And since we already determined that IC and IE will be approximately the same, it's going to be 2.5 milliamps times 2k ohms or 5 volts. So we have a 5 volt drop here and here. To find VCE, remember we're interested in the voltage from collector to emitter. So what the only voltage that's going to be left is, is what's left after the voltage drops on RC1 and RE1, RE2. And we have all both of those voltages. We have 5 volts here and 6 volts here. So we just have to take the 12 volts and subtract the total of these two voltages. And we get a voltage from collector to emitter of 6.4 volts. And DC, and this is all for you know checking the load line and making sure that uh, that everything's going to work out properly. Uh, the, the Q points for the AC intersect that. We know that uh, in cutoff the collector to or the base to emitter goes into reverse bias. So we have two opens on both of the transistors. So VCC is going to be about 12 volts. And the saturation current is going to be VCC divided by RE plus RC. And this is so because the base to collector goes into forward bias. The only limiting factors for current then are RC1 and RE1 and RE2. or RC2 and RE3 and 4. All the same values, so just take the 12 volts and divide it by the sum of all of these resistances. And we get 5.36 milliamps. And this gives us all the information that we're going to need for our Q point or DC. Let's find the voltage gain for each one of these stages. It's going to be a little bit more involved in that we have to, to find the resistance that's going to be on the collector of T1. We have to know what kind of impedance the entire stage for T2 presents to T1. And to do that, we have to solve this stage first. And to solve the voltage gain for this stage, remember the AC on, on this stage is going to flow through the circuit in this fashion. So the input side is going to go through RE3 and R'E, and our output side is going to split at this point, which tells us that RC2 and RL are in parallel. So RC2 and RL, we know, are going to be in parallel. So we have 2K in parallel to 5.6k over RE3, which is 120 ohms, plus R'E. Well, we didn't find R'E or REJ, but we know that 25 millivolts divided by the emitter current will give us that value. Our emitter current was 2.5 milliamps, so that just gives us an exact value of 10 ohms. 
And using this, we come up with a gain for this first stage of 11.31, or the second stage of 11.31 times. So whatever output comes from this stage, T1 stage, into the base of T2, at this point it's going to be 11.3 times bigger than it was when it came in. To find the impedance of this stage, we have to know R in base for that stage. And this is dependent on, on beta. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the worst case condition for beta that we can have, again, using a 2N3904. And the worst case condition for beta in a 3904 is 100. I know that this one's larger, but again, always use the worst case. That way you can eliminate beta as a factor largely and you know, have a very stable circuit. And then we're going to multiply beta by the total resistance on that input side. So REJ was our 10 ohms and RE3 was 120. So we have 13 K ohms for R in on the base. Well, R in on the base is in parallel with RB3 and RB4. Remember, any current that comes through here is going to split in all three of these directions. So as far as we're concerned, uh, the voltage here, it's all parallel. And we have 56K plus the 6.8K plus the 13K and we get a total resistance on the base of 4.1K ohms or total resistance on the input of 4.1. Now that gives us the Zn for the next stage and again this is parallel to RC1 because as before, change colors, the AC is going to come in here through RE1 now and then through REJ and then again it's going to split at that point. So RC1 is in parallel with Zn which we determined was that 4.14K. We have the 2K in parallel with the 4.14K over the 120 ohms plus the 10. And this stage will have a gain of, and I'll try to let's put that down here, 10.38. So here there are the two stages of our circuit. So AV1 has 10.38. And AV2 has 11.31. Simply multiplying two, the two together will give us the total gain of this, of this circuit. And we're going to end up with a gain of 117.4. And we can check this circuit for, for accuracy by just taking our 10.31, because we know that's the, state, the gain of that first stage. Well, if we have 60 millivolts coming in, and we multiply this by 10.31, one, then the gain of this, or the output of this, should be 622.8 millivolts, or 623 millivolts. So we should have 623 millivolts at this stage. And remember, this is going to be out of phase with the input. So this, the input, if it's going positive, this output is going to be amplified but going negative, and then it's going to go into the next stage, and then it's going to be amplified again, but it's going to go positive once again. So the output and the input should be very much in phase. So AV total, or the, the total voltage out, is going to be just these two multiplied together, so 117.4 times the 60 millivolts, peak to peak, and our output voltage is 7.04 volts peak to peak. Or here's a little bit of extra material on how to determine what the load lines are going to be for 
for a multi-stage amplifier. And remember, we have to know what Zn is, again, uh, on that first stage before we can calculate anything on that one. And to do that, we need the RC value, uh, the AC resistance on, on transistor circuit one and the AC resistance on transistor circuit two. So RC2 is, is simply the outputs in parallel, the output values in parallel to each other. And the values we have for RC2 were, were 2K in parallel with 5.6K for a total resistance of 1.47K ohms on that part of the circuit. And if we do the other one, we, we can have the 2K uh, for RC1 and 4.1K for the Zn for a total of 1.35K ohms. So now we have all of the resistance for this part of the circuit up here. And what we need to do is then find what the resistance of the circuit is on the lower section. So if you remember, saturation is that point when both these junctions go into forward bias, so the only thing that's going to limit the current, and again, we're treating this like a AC with a, a zero volt, zero current amplitude, so we can kind of cheat and say, well, this is parallel to this because it's AC and this is now a, a short for the AC, which means it goes this way and it goes through here. And of course, the AC is going to bypass RE2 and go to ground through this capacitor. So this, this is going to be in the circuit as well as this parallel value we have on the top. And that's where uh, this lower section right here comes. So we know we have an IC of 2.5 milliamps and that VCE was 6.8 volts and we take the resistance on the lower portion of the circuit, which was the 1.47K plus 120 ohms, and we're going to end up with 6.53 milliamps for that second stage saturation. Cutoff is going to be 6.8 volts plus 2.5 milliamps times the sum of these two values again, 1.47K plus 120, and our cutoff is 10.38 volts. The second stage, or the, I'm sorry, the first stage, again exactly the same current, the stages were identical for DC, Plus, again, voltage collector to emitter is going to be the same 6.8 volts. And this should be a plus, not a, not a parallel. So we have the 6.8 volts divided by the 1.35 K ohms plus 120 for a current of 6.85 milliamps and then cut off 6.8 volts plus 2.5 milliamps times 1.35 K plus 120. And our current, or our voltage then is 10 point, 10.08 volts collected to a meter. If we plot this on the graph, and I, I chose colors that are going to be represented, represented on the scope by, by these same colors. So our black line is the Q point, or is the load line for the DC, and there's our Q point. So we, if you remember that our saturation was 5.36 milliamps, and our cutoff can't be more than 12 volts, so we just play connect the dots, and there we go. You should also recall that we had 6.8 volts from collector to emitter so if we go back up here it should be somewhere in this in this point and I probably missed a little bit so it should be a little farther down this way so here's our Q point now 
if everything is right, that Q point should be intersected by both of these load lines and to indicate that everything that we have the stability in the right, uh, well, that we did the calculations the right way. So if we go over the first one, 6.53 and 10.38, and here's our 6.53 and our 10.38, and you know, connect the dots again, and there's our intersection point. And for the second circuit, we have 6.85 milliamps, so we're up here almost 6.9 and we have 10.08 so we're, it's you might as well just say it's 10 point well it's 10.1 it's pretty close we can't measure it again on this scale connect the dots and again it's intersects the Q point so here's there are our AC load lines and our DC load lines and our quiescent point for the DC and everything is intersecting nice so now let's check the circuit a couple of DC points on, on both of the stages to make sure that everything is biased correctly and then look at the outputs on a scope and also measure the outputs with a multimeter because that'll give us a little bit more accurate readings on the voltages than we can get from the scope. The scope we'll just use to get the, the phase relationships and, and prove that, the, that everything is, is working the way that it should. One more time, here's the schematic for our circuit, and you can see the 56k ohm resistors are RB3 and RB1, RB2 is 6.8, here and here, and you can see RC1, RC2 are the same value, as well as RE1, 2, 3, and 4, and then we have our 5.6k ohm resistor with the output. We're bypassing RE4 and RE2 with the capacitors so they're not part of the AC calculations and it will prove the gain and again we use the, the split resistor on the emitter to improve, improve the, the fidelity of the circuit because we don't want R prime E or REJ varying a lot and causing a distorted output because one side is amplified more than the other. So here's the actual circuit and here are here is a RB1, RB2, 3, and 4. There's RC2, or there's RC1. There's RC2. Our load resistor, and then our bypassed resistor, the uh, 120s on both stages. And you can see the hookup. Let's see if I can move it a little bit. You can see that the input is coming into the the base of our transistor. Here's our emitter. Here's our collector. And the output is taken off of the collector, coupled into the next stage onto the base, and then taken off of the collector from the final stage. So I'll apply some DC power to this, and then we can see if our calculations were correct. As good a place as any to start is the voltage on the base, and we should have 1.3 volts between base and ground. So here's my ground connection, and here's my base, and I have a 1.25 practically on T1. On T2, we've got 1.25 again, so that's, that's good and close. Voltage on the emitter on both stages should be about 0.6, so that's the second stage and the first stage also about 0.6. Collector to emitter voltage should be 6.4 volts and for the first stage it is 6.4 volts and for the second stage 6.4 volts and since everything else is resistive and the voltages are correct we can we can see that everything is, a, is working properly. So let's add AC voltage to the circuit and look at the phase relationships and also determine what the voltage outs what the voltage out is going to be. On the scope you can see three waveforms uh, the yellow waveform being our input the 60 millivolts peak to peak the second stage is in blue and then the final output stage is in in the purple trace. And you can see that each one is, is progressively larger. I've got the last two stages 
the blue and the purple trace, both of those are one volt per division. So you can see they are definitely progressively larger and the input is at 50 millivolts peak to peak per division. Well, this indicates then that, well, everything is obviously working correctly because you recall that the first stage between, which is uh, the input here and the output in blue, there's one, that 180 degree phase shift between input and output. And then between this stage in blue and the purple, there is another phase shift, which is what should occur when we go through another transistor. So this is on the base of stage two, and this is the output then, of stage three. So we got that other 180 degree phase shift. And you can see that we definitely got a voltage gain on each stage. And we'll use a multimeter to determine with a little bit more accuracy what these gains actually are because the scope just it doesn't have the resolution that you know we'd like to really if we want to check for any kind of accuracy the scope because of the you know the thickness of the lines and and the, the way it measures device uh, measures voltages you now sometimes it's it's a little peculiar or, or, or it's just plain wrong because I've seen that many oscilloscopes that when you set them to measure an automatic, uh, for example, volts peak to peak, they'll measure from the top of the trace on, on the scope to, to the bottom of the trace. Well, the problem with that, they're including the thickness of the line in the measurement. And, and you really should not because it's, you know, think of the, of the trace as just, if it was a perfect world, the trace would be a, a, a very, you know, a, a perfectly thin, super little thin line that, that was very exact. But thickness, you know, we have to have it, otherwise we don't see it. So any thickness that the trace, that the scope adds to the, uh, the trace increases error. So the best thing to do is use either the bottom trace to do, of each trace to do measurements or the top. What I mean by that is, and a good example is, is this input. If I was measuring this trace, this yellow trace, I would measure from this point to this point, from bottom trace to bottom trace. That eliminates the thickness of the line. Either way, let's get to the uh, multimeter and measure the voltages. And remember, the voltimeter measures everything in RMS, so we have to do a conversion to get it to volts peak to peak. All the calculations that, that I came up with were in, in peak to peak. And so let's go right ahead and see how everything worked out. Now here's my circuit and still set up the, as it was before. So let's measure the voltage coming into the circuit first. And remember everything is going to be in RMS on the, on the, uh, on the meter. And uh, we have a voltage in of 21 point 21.2 and multiply that by the 2.828 to get to volts peak to peak and you should have just about 60 millivolts so we're, I'm, I'm sure that we're, we're quite accurate so if everything is working this stage should have give us a gain of, of about 10 so measuring the output of that stage we now have 226 point 227 and then climbing just a little bit. So we've probably got around 650 millivolts or so. And again, uh, 650 peak to peak. And that's, that gives us that, that gain. And finally having a gain of 11.3 on, on this stage should give us just about seven volts. And I need to change the range. And it's 2.3. 385 and multiplying that by the 2.828 gives us an output voltage of 6.75 volts and or and if we want to determine what we're supposed to have compared to what we did come up with remember it's just a what we're looking for is the voltage or, or the percent of error. And to get the percent of error, we take the calculated value or the expected value and subtract that from 
the actual value or the measured value and then divide that by our calculated value and multiply it by 100. So our calculated value was 7.04 and we came up with a value of 6.74 and then we're going to divide that by 7.04 and multiply that by 100 and that will give us a difference of 4.26% or 4.3%. So not knowing the, the betas in these circuits didn't matter at all, did it? It just, it, it just came down to you know, designing these bypasses correctly, getting the gain that we wanted, and, elim and we just eliminated the value of beta. Now, another way thing that you'll see in, in these circuits very often is, is gain in, measured as a value of decibels. And it's a very simple way to, to de determine how much dB gain that we have. And this is actually calculated by taking the actual, let me move this up here a little, by taking the calculated gain, and our overall calculated gain was 117.4. And so this is an AV. It's AV total, so it's 117.4. But what if we want to do this in decibels? Remember, decibels are a logarithmic scale. And to do this, just take your calculator and, and put in this number. So we, what we have is a gain of 117.4. Um, to get decibels for volts, it's just a matter of taking 20 times the logarithm of the voltage out over the voltage in. So V out over V in. And well, we know that the V out over V in gave us that ratio of 117 calculated. So we really don't need to do this to get that ratio. So now it's 20 times the log of 117.4. And to do that on your calculator, and it depends depends on which calculator you have on the orders of the operation. So I'm just using a, an expensive Casio and a bit better view here. So we're going to t take 20 times the logarithm of 117.4 and we have a gain then of 41.4 decibels. And there's another entire video on, on just doing uh, dB gain in, in these circuits, and, and I'll probably do that at one point, hopefully soon. Uh, every time I do another video, I come up with a new idea for still more. Well, anyway, I hope you found this informative and kind of threw this in a, as an aside. Eventually, I'm going to get the, to the Darlington pairs and the Sisquai pairs and and differential amplifiers. But until then, again, hopefully you enjoyed this and questions, please let me know and I will try to answer them.